Hi. I'd like to welcome everybody who's coming and listening to us for the first time this summer, or perhaps you're joining us, have joined us for some of the earlier sessions. This is the last in this, the summer series of webinars that have been provided by FICA.org. As most of us are familiar with FICA, they have been very conscientious in providing resources on a local, regional, and national level. So it's been really very exciting to have this new venue of webinars that can be listened to live, or they can, you can go back and listen to them again, or listen to ones that you have missed. So today's feature is going to be on pediatric thyroid cancer. Now, Today is going to focus primarily on differentiated thyroid cancer in pediatrics because we have some time constraints. So we're going to be saving the medullary thyroid cancer information for a later webinar. We have two great speakers who will be presenting today, Dr. Gary Francis, who is at the Children's Hospital of Richmond, and Dr. Stephen Wagaspak, who is at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Both of them are members of the FICUS Medical Advisory Council. They are also both members of the American Thyroid Association's panel on developing guidelines for the treatment of thyroid cancer in children. They both have a very strong background and level of expertise in endocrine tumors and particularly thyroid cancer. We're very fortunate to have them today. And before I turn this the speaker, turn this over to the speakers. I would like to remind you that we welcome questions. Please type them in uh, and try to make them as succinct as possible to help with the time limits. Also, please remember that any information that's provided here is intended not to be direct medical advice, but rather information to help you un more understand the disease. So. I would also like to remind you of the annual conference that will be in LA this year in October. So we hope to see you there. Right now, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Gary Francis. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, all um, participants, for being here today and um, letting us talk and share a little bit of information about children with thyroid cancer. Um, we'd like to start by uh, stating that neither Dr. Wagaspak nor I have any uh, disclosures or financial relationships with anything we may talk about during this conference. Our objectives are to review the major types of thyroid cancers in children. We'll talk about potentially how they arise, spend a fair amount of time talking on the prognosis of thyroid cancer for children, which is remarkably different than it is for adults. We'll review the clinical presentation and clinical management. So let's talk about why we think these tumors might arise. First off, when we talk about differentiated thyroid cancers, we're mainly talking about papillary, including follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, and other histologic types, tall cell variant, and there's some other more rare forms of papillary thyroid cancer in children. And we're also talking about follicular thyroid cancer which is distinguished into two different categories, widely invasive and minimally invasive, based on how much those um, cancer cells seem to have spread into and beyond the capsules surrounding the tumor and the blood vessels that supply the tumor. As we said a little bit ago, we're going to defer questions and discussion of medullary thyroid cancer until the end of this presentation and or on another date. But that is another heritable syndrome, beginning with um, hyperplasia of specialized cells in the thyroid called C cells. And um, the majority of those are associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia. And lastly, we distinguish these from anaplastic thyroid cancer, a very poorly differentiated tumor with um, poor treatment and poor outcome, which fortunately is almost never seen in children. The behavior of papillary and follicular thyroid cancers is a little bit different. Papillary thyroid cancers are more likely to spread to the regional lymph nodes, whereas follicular thyroid cancers usually do not unless they're a um, less well-differentiated variant. However, papillary thyroid cancers um, usually only get into the bloodstream and distant sites such as the lungs or bone 
if there's been extensive involvement of the lymph nodes in the neck. But follicular thyroid cancer tends to go to bloodstream first before lymph nodes. So papillary thyroid cancer, fortunately, is the most common variety that we're going to see in children, and most of the metastases and most of the recurrence are in regional lymph nodes in the neck, not uh, as many hematogenous spread to lungs and bones. Papillary thyroid cancer, however, is commonly multifocal. We can find that on both sides or multiple lesions on one side of the thyroid. Follicular thyroid cancer, even though it tends to spread into bloodstream fairly early on, is usually a solitary lesion. Medullary thyroid cancer, most often spreads by lymphatic channels. 75% of patients with tumors greater than one centimeter in size will have lymph node involvement. And uh, it is much less likely to occur at the stages of C-cell hyperplasia or when there's um, microscopic medullary thyroid cancer. There can, however, be hematogenous spread to lungs, liver, bone, and other sites. And in hereditary forms of this disease, it tends to be multifocal so that total thyroidectomy is the treatment of choice. And as you can see by the red arrow, you can see those uh, slightly pale lesions that are um, medullary thyroid cancer. So how common are thyroid cancers in children, and at what age groups do they tend to occur? And as you can see from this pie graph, it's about 10% of all cancers in children. And you can also see down in the bottom in the blue box on the left, that they're very uncommon in children less than about 10 years of age, but much more common in our adolescents and young adults. Uh, adolescents between 15 and 19 years of age, you can see that instead of um, a handful of patients, there were 355. And then by the time you get to be young adults, 25 to 29 years of age, about 1,200. So it's clearly an age-dependent disease. That also is shown on the right-hand portion of this graph, where you see this dramatic increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer in that late adolescent age group, compared to the very few cases that are seen in children less than age 10. It also shows something else quite remarkable, that this is a disease of young women. And so it's very uncommon to see thyroid cancer in um, teenage boys. On the left-hand side, you can see not only the same age-related relationships shown in red, but you can see that this is much more common in Caucasian than African-American individuals, and again, much more common in women than men. Let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology. Why might these tumors arise? Well, we know there are certain risk factors that increase the probability that children will develop differentiated thyroid cancer. One of the most common ones is exposure to ionizing radiation, X-ray, um, environmental factors such as exposure to the Chernobyl nuclear accident, potentially the nuclear accident in Japan, and that this tends to lead to papillary thyroid cancer most commonly. Um, and there are mutations that we also can find in the DNA that arise leading to papillary thyroid cancer. The most common in children are rearrangements where there's a RET, what's called a proto-oncogene. This is a gene that controls cell division and multiplication, and it gets moved to the wrong place in your DNA. So it's no longer regulated in its usual manner, but regulated by other genes that may increase its expression dramatically so that the cells just divide over and over and over again. There are also mutations in something called BRAF or RAS. These are much less common in children and unfortunately tend to be associated with not as favorable an outcome. For follicular thyroid cancers, there are also gene rearrangements in RAS and um, PI3 kinase, again, cancer-promoting genes, and then um, uh, PPAR gamma, PAX8 uh, genetic rearrangement, all of which can lead to follicular thyroid cancer. And then there are some hereditary forms of papillary thyroid cancer that are associated with other cancer syndromes. For example, familial adenomatoid polyposis. These patients are susceptible to getting um, polyps of the GI tract and ultimately uh, colon cancer as they get older, um, but that is commonly associated with papillary thyroid cancer.
Carney complex and Cowden syndrome are two more that are associated with differentiated thyroid cancers in the context of cancers of other tissues. So once we see that a child has thyroid cancer, or we suspect that, how do we stage that? What's the prognosis? Well, children tend to present with much larger tumors and a greater incidence of lymph node metastases than do adults. So years ago, we thought this was far more aggressive disease, and that it had spread widely beyond what we would commonly see in an adult. Despite that fact, children very rarely die from this disease. Only about 1 or 2 percent in long-term studies die from their thyroid cancer. It could be because these tumors are more responsive to thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the pituitary and controls growth of the thyroid and thyroid cancer. It could be because we see these different mutations that we talked about, that REP-PTC mutations are more common in children, BRAF are more common in adults. It could be because we just don't see any of those anaplastic, poorly differentiated tumors in children. Could be other things. Maybe kids just handle this disease with their immune system a little bit differently than adults. But the good news is the prognosis is generally excellent. We talk about staging. This slide is very complicated. It shows you that there are multiple stages of thyroid cancer that you might have as an adult. But if you look over in the top left-hand corner, for patients less than 45 years of age, which includes all of our children, there are really only two stages. Stage 1, which is confined to the thyroid, and stage 2, um, which includes disease beyond the thyroid. And, as you can see in this slide, our survival for these differentiated forms of thyroid cancer is quite favorable. So um, over um, 400 months, you see that survival is about 98% for children with papillary or follicular thyroid cancer, and somewhat lower than that, maybe 92% for um, children with medullary thyroid cancer. But overall, these have a very favorable long-term survival. The interesting thing is that if you look at adults, and if they have disease, thyroid cancer, that is spread to the lung, their probability of surviving very long with that is not very good. But in children, despite widespread pulmonary metastases to the lungs, as shown in these lungs on the left by CT scan and then the radionuclide scan on the right with all that dark uptake in the lung, the survival for these patients is excellent. And many of these patients never see progression of their disease. So it is not a bad not as bad a prognostic feature for a child to have pulmonary metastasis or lung metastasis as it is for adults. About 30% of children will develop recurrent disease after their initial therapy. So they may have um, thyroid surgery, they may have the thyroid removed, they may or may not have radioactive iodine, depending on the extent of their disease. But over time, over about 20 years, maybe as many as 20, 25, ultimately 30% of these patients will develop some thyroid cancer, usually in the cervical lymph nodes, again, and may need treatment. Now, this is a very interesting but complicated slide. These were children who developed thyroid cancer after the Chernobyl nuclear accident, and they were treated in Russia. If you look at the far left-hand part of that slide, you see that dark line down the middle. And let me see if I can highlight that with a little uh, highlighter here. Um, that portion of the slide, these children were being treated with radioactive iodine periodically. And what you can see is that their disease continued to decrease, continued to improve, as measured by a protein in blood called thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is a protein that's only made in the thyroid, so we can use that as an index of how much thyroid or how much thyroid cancer still remains behind. And these patients were treated on regular intervals, and as you can see, their thyroglobulin levels continued to decline until they got to this area with the dotted lines. And that was when their treatment with radioactive iodine was discontinued. And what you see after that, again highlighted in yellow, was that the thyroglobulin levels continued to decline even though they were no longer being continuously treated with radioactive iodine. So we think that that may have long-term effects in children and lead to potentially um, uh, continued cell death of thyroid cancer. So let's talk about how these patients present. Most commonly in children, they present with a mass in the thyroid or a thyroid nodule. And you may be able to see it as in this case, you may be able to feel it as in this case. 
Sometimes, however, they just present with enlarged lymph nodes in the neck. And um, so pediatricians, ear, nose, and throat doctors, and others need to be aware um, that uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the neck that persist, one should consider looking at the thyroid in great detail. And sometimes we actually see this presenting with um, nodular disease in the lungs. We like to try to do some staging. As we said earlier, the um, conventional staging that we use for adults doesn't work too well for kids. It's either stage one or stage two. But we try to get information about what the thyroid cancer looks like by doing a neck ultrasound with a fine needle aspiration or a biopsy where you put a small needle into the lesion and take out cells. And we try to identify um, metastatic disease by looking um, with that neck ultrasound. We look at the other side of the thyroid. We look at the lymph nodes in the neck. We tend to do a chest x-ray to see if there are any nodules in the lung. We sometimes get thyroglobulin and thyroglobulin antibody levels at initial presentation. Um, and we certainly use those for follow-up. And if there's a lot of bulky disease in the neck, CT scanning or other cross-sectional imaging may be helpful to try to identify what structures are actually involved. Ultrasound is one of our key things for staging in kids. As you can see on the left-hand side under the word ultrasound, there's an identifiable lesion in that side of the thyroid that you can actually see and feel on the patient. But the ultrasound also shows you what the other side of the thyroid looks like, and you can also see lymph nodes that you might not be able to feel. So it's a very useful test for us. Chest x-rays, we said, helps us identify metastatic disease to the lung. We may miss some small lung lesions, but those are typically going to be picked up with a radioactive iodine scan. And we might consider doing a chest CT if there is significant disease in the neck with multiple um, metastases involved. As we said, thyroglobulin is a protein that's made only in the thyroid and in thyroid cancer cells. So it can be very specific and sensitive in measuring and monitoring the extent of disease. Um, we tend to begin to measure that and pay attention to that only after patients have been diagnosed with papillary or follicular thyroid cancer. We always want to check for thyroglobulin antibodies. Those interfere with the assay and unfortunately are present in about 25% of patients with thyroid cancer. So uh, the test is good in about 75% of patients, but those with the antibodies, we can't rely on it as much. We may follow antibody levels in those patients and hope that as their disease resolves, that those antibody levels will decline over time. It tends to take years, but um, as long as the antibody levels are continuing to decline, that's a very favorable prognostic indicator. Sometimes we do a stimulation test, um, a thyrogen stimulation test or um, recombinant TSH, in order to stimulate thyroglobulin levels. So the thyroid and thyroid cancer make some thyroglobulin all the time, but if you treat them with TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, they make much more. And so that enhances the sensitivity of our test and makes it much more likely to detect small amounts of thyroid cancer. So that's sort of how these patients typically present. That's how we typically evaluate them early on uh, prior to their initial therapy. And Dr. Wagaspak is now going to take us through how we would typically treat these patients. Stephen. Thank you, Gary, and, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such a delight to be with you guys. Wish we could be there in person with each of one, one of you. So I'd like to take up uh, the task here of talking about treatment. And whenever we talk about the treatment of pediatric thyroid cancer, I, I think we have to remember that you know it takes it takes a village to really provide the the, the level of care you guys are expecting for for your children with this disease. And so you know surrounding the patient and the family are all these different specialties, um, and it's important to you know, always we advocate, you know, finding, you know, the right team to take care of your child who has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. So most of you guys who are on this already have dealt with the initial diagnosis, but I think one of the most important things that I like to tell parents of children who are newly diagnosed is that, you know, the first thing is take a deep breath and, and know that it's going to be okay, because as you saw with Dr. Francis, we know the prognosis long term is excellent for our children. And, um, you know, to try, after you take that deep breath, try to find the team that's going to be best suited to take care of your child. The general approach to papillary carcinoma, and this would also be pertinent for follicular carcinoma, but not medullary. Uh, we'll cover that later, hopefully, if time allows, 
Um, the first thing is to actually find a very experienced thyroid surgeon who is skilled in the management of thyroid cancer in the operating room. And usually what is first undertaken is a, total, a complete removal of the thyroid gland followed in most cases by lymph node dissection. Um, we know that children have a high rate of lymph node metastasis. A lot of times this is visible and uh, we would want those lymph nodes removed at the first surgery because we would only want someone to have surgery once for their thyroid carcinoma. What's more controversial and we won't cover today is should a surgeon who's skilled in the area routinely remove lymph nodes in the center of the neck that may or may not be involved with thyroid cancer. But there are some people who advocate that if uh, an experienced surgeon is available. Following surgery, then there's a consideration to possible treatment with radioactive iodine, and we will discuss that further. But I, I think Gary and I share the, the same approach that each child is individual and requires ongoing evaluation of their risk and um, what are the benefits of radioactive iodine might be. So instead of across the board always saying that uh, treatment with radioactive iodine is given in all cases, I think we're starting to recognize that this can be individualized based upon the data and considered uh, after surgery. Finally, long term, we give thyroid hormone uh, a little bit in, high, in uh, slightly higher doses than is required to cause the TSH level to be suppressed. So we kind of take over the body's um, production of thyroid hormone and deliberately give a little bit more than is necessary. And the thought of that is that with a lower TSH level, which acts as fuel for thyroid growth, that we would minimize any risk of recurrence or progression of thyroid cancer. As I mentioned, surgery is really the, the most important step in the management of thyroid carcinoma. And in most cases, we would advocate for a total thyroidectomy, meaning removing the whole thyroid. There may be some select cases, however, where doing less than a total thyroidectomy be, may be appropriate, but in general, we would favor total thyroidectomy. Now, surgical therapy is focused at, obviously, uh, it, it, it's an oncological procedure. So the surgeon is trying to get rid of all of the uh, cancer in, in the neck. So besides the thyroidectomy, as I mentioned earlier, we want to also remove involved lymph nodes, which is actually more pertinent for papillary and medullary carcinomas. So at the time of surgery, we would like to, via the preoperative staging, actually know which child has lymph nodes or not. So the surgeon can go into surgery up front knowing whether or not a lymph node dissection is um, involved or is, is, is required. So if we know the patient has lymph nodes in the lateral neck, then the surgeon up front knows they have to dissect the lymph nodes in the lateral neck and also in the central neck. And that is the area of the neck um, that you can see right here um, with my little check marks, which is where the thyroid lives. Whether or not we prophylactically remove lymph nodes in the central neck that are not clearly involved with cancer is a matter of debate, but may be considered in the hands of a skilled surgeon. And I already mentioned that we would do a lateral neck dissection if preoperatively we know that there are lymph nodes involved in that side of the neck. And when we talk about the lateral neck, and, and you guys may have heard of all these different levels, but basically where the check marks are are called the central neck, and then the lateral neck basically is primarily this area here that you see the little dot. Um, so levels two, three, four, and sometimes this part of level five are actually the lateral neck, and those are often involved with lymph nodes. I won't belabor the point, but the, the point of this um, slide is really that the surgeon should be one who is a high volume surgeon and I, I personally define that as someone who does over a hundred neck procedures a year um, because we know that outcomes are improved with the more experience the surgeon has. After surgery we then talk about further evaluation and possible treatment with radioactive iodine and there are three goals of radioactive iodine therapy. The first goal is to do what's um, called remnant ablation. So what that does is just take the normal residual thyroid tissue, which we call the remnant, and just get rid of that. And there's some belief that, well, that will help us to facilitate future uh, detection of recurrences and will help us in the long run. Adjuvant therapy 
is when we know that someone is very likely to still have cancer cells in their neck. And so we give radioactive iodine with the hopes of killing those cancer cells and preventing that from becoming an issue in the future. And finally, radioactive iodine therapy is when we actually know that there is disease present. As you can see on the left side here with a patient with lung metastasis, here on the right side, um, someone who has an obvious lymph node metastasis at the kind of one o'clock position. Um, that is um, the major role of radioactive iodine therapy. So when we look at these three indications, there's no controversy at all about using radioactive iodine to, to treat known radioactive iodine disease uh, excuse me, radioactive iodine avid disease. What is more becoming more controversial is the second component of adjuvant therapy. I think most of us are recognizing now that routine remnant ablation is not likely to add to long-term survival or risks of recurrence, um, and that thyroglobulin levels can actually be monitored uh, effectively in patients who have not received radioactive iodine therapy. But where we don't have the answers yet is the, the role of adjuvant therapy. Does giving radioactive iodine clearly prevent recurrences in people we think are at high risk for recurrent disease? And that's where we need to do more study. There are conflicting reports in the literature. This is a report from a nuclear medicine group that showed that iodine therapy in children appears to increase disease-free survival. And what that means is just basically being detected to have disease. It doesn't mean uh, survival in terms of life or death. It's just disease-free survival means how long does it take to recognize that there's still residual disease. Other series, such as this big series from the Mayo Clinic, really did not see a long-term impact between those children who received radioactive iodine and those who did not. Now, all of these studies have problems because they, they are retrospective, meaning they are looking backwards only. Um, and that's the problem with this very rare disease in which you know, someone would need 20 or 30 years of follow-up in a prospective fashion to truly answer these questions. The American Thyroid Association has guidelines for the management of adults with papillary carcinoma um, and follicular carcinoma. And in their most recent update in 2009, they actually started to lay some of the groundwork for recognizing that perhaps there are some cases in which radioactive iodine is not clearly indicated or that there is not clear data that it's going to help the patient. And this is because of some large registries that have looked at adult patients with papillary carcinoma and found that people with low risk disease, meaning low risk for death from disease, it's not clear that those patients benefit from routine radio radioactive iodine. And so that's partly why um, we are moving towards an individualized approach in children in giving iodine to those children wh whom we feel will truly benefit from it. And in those where we feel like they have no evidence of disease and are unlikely to benefit from it, we're actually steering away from it a little bit more in our, in our typical practice. But the listeners should know this is quite controversial among those of us who deal with this. To summarize the treatment, you know, when someone is diagnosed with papillary carcinoma, um, this doesn't quite apply to follicular because follicular carcinoma is usually a diagnosis that's made only after surgery. And we can get more into that later if needed. But after preoperative staging, then we would first do total thyroidectomy, uh, lymph node dissection, and then uh, what Dr. Francis and I recommend is doing a further evaluation after surgery, and this can be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months after surgery. And at that time, we can actually look at a thyroid scan using a diagnostic or small dose of radioactive iodine. We can look at the thyroglobulin as a tumor marker, and using all of that information, as well as the clinical history, the pathology, the surgical notes, then determine whether or not a child should be treated with iodine, or maybe this is someone who could be watched safely without getting uh, radioactive iodine. And so this is kind of a general algorithm and in, in, in approach to, um, to treatment. Won't spend a lot of time on this, but again, areas of uh, differing opinions and, and not a lot of research or data to support one way or the other, but there are two ways that you can actually get radioactive iodine. One is with routine withdrawal of thyroid hormone, and that means not taking any thyroid hormone. Uh, for generally about two weeks is adequate in children, and what happens is the TSH will rise, and that will facilitate being able to evaluate and treat with iodine if indicated. There's also a medicine out there called recombinant TSH, 
Um, that can be given as a series of two injections while a patient stays on their thyroid hormone. Uh, there certainly is data to say that it's effective for routine ablation and some accruing data that it can be used in other situations as well. Um, there is some data also in children in a retrospective uh, fashion that would suggest this is safe. But it is a costly uh, medication. It limits somewhat the ability to do a diagnostic scan. And I, I think the one compelling thing is that, you know, there might be overall less radiation exposure to normal tissues compared to withdrawal. But um, I, I personally get around that by trying not to give radioactive iodine to all the kids. So um, that, you know, is one way to, to avoid that possible concern. Dr. Francis and I do, do agree that a diagnostic scan is very helpful. Um, there are some people who will treat just based upon pathology. For example, a child has lymph node metastasis um, that were just described in the pathology report, and they'll just say, okay, we have to give iodine and give this dose, which is often a higher dose than is necessary for remnant ablation, um, without doing a diagnostic scan and then doing the post-treatment scan. So we feel a diagnostic scan is helpful because there are some situations where a child might have no thyroid uptake and no thyroglobulin and therefore could be spared an unnecessary dose of radioactive iodine. And there might be other cases where you might identify a disease you weren't aware of, such as in the lungs. So a diagnostic scan is usually very helpful. Um, and of course, after treatment, if treatment is given, we always do a post-treatment scan to look in, um, for evidence of disease that we were not aware of. Dosing, again, has not been studied. This is very empiric. A lot of it is just based on a weight-based calculation of treatment using adult standards. So no real, quite um, clear way to do this, and nothing certainly that has been tested in a clinical trial. But generally, we would just see what we would give an adult and adjust it for the child size. The reason we do a post-treatment scan is illustrated in this case, uh, where the diagnostic scan um, is here on the left side. And you can see there's really not much uptake that's seen outside of the normal salivary uptake here and stomach uptake. And after treatment, there is clear thyroid bed uptake and also some scattered small pulmonary metastasis. And, and that is why we do a post-treatment scan. We're also now incorporating the routine use of SPECT-CT in our post-treatment scans. And what a SPECT-CT is, is at the time of the scan, we actually get a CAT scan, and then we confuse the pictures of the iodine scan with the CAT scan. And I found this quite helpful in, in the children we treat here because it helps us truly understand what we're seeing. And this, this is just one example where this child had some uptake here in the neck that actually correlated to what looks like normal thyroid tissue in an ectopic location. So we could feel reassured that that's not cancer, that's normal thyroid tissue. Here at the bottom left, you can see there was uptake right next to the clavicle. So that is a lymph node. Um, and we know that, okay, there is some lymph node disease there. We can follow that spot. And this child also had some pulmonary uptake that was corroborated by the CT component that showed a small pulmonary nodule. So we're starting to use this a lot more to help us better understand the location of iodine uptake and for us to know long term what areas of the body we need to follow. In cases where the child has very diffuse pulmonary metastatic disease, this is a situation where we consider something called dosimetry. And dosimetry is when the child goes through a series of thyroid scans after getting a test dose of iodine. And it helps us to calculate what are the safe levels we can administer this child to minimize the adverse effects of radioactive iodine um, on the lungs and the bone marrow. And one thing we certainly want to avoid is over aggressively treating a child who has a good prognosis disease, because in very rare cases we can see situations where iodine was given too vigorously, and that leads to scarring of the lungs, something called pulmonary fibrosis. And certainly we would like to avoid that in those situations. So in general, for, for kids who have diffuse pulmonary metastatic disease, we will consider dosimetry. I uh, particularly tend to treat a little less aggressively. Uh, I don't I give you know appropriate doses, but not so high doses that we're going to put the lungs at risk. And also, based upon the data that Dr. Francis showed the group, 
to, to, to feel comfortable knowing that these treatments can likely be spaced out over time, over the course of, of a child's life, instead of every six months getting a high dose of iodine, because I think we now have accruing data that would suggest that we have to give iodine a little time to work, and that it appears to continue to work even years after the dose. The side effects of radioactive iodine, certainly there are early side effects and late side effects. Uh, the early side effects can be sialadenitis, which is an inflammation of the salivary glands. It kind of looks like mumps. There can be nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea related to the dose. And transiently, the platelet counts and white cell counts can be affected, but those tend to bounce back. So it's not something we routinely monitor for. What we are more concerned about are the late side effects, um, and, and particularly when you have a child who's less than age 10 who has uh, metastatic disease that you know will require, you know, at least a couple of courses of iodine over the course of their lives. You know, we want to effectively treat the disease while not needlessly exposing the, the child to unnecessary risks related to the therapy. So some of the long-term things we think about is the effect on salivary gland function, um, which can include a dry mouth, xerostomia, as well as stones that can develop in the salivary ducts. Um, infertility is not as huge of a concern, although not as studied in uh, pubertal boys, but at least in adults. We are very reassured by data in adults that fertility um, is not impaired. So for, for those of you who have um, children who have gotten iodine, there, you can reassure them that there should be no long-term impact. Pulmonary fibrosis, I already mentioned. We do not know the long-term effects on the bone marrow. And, and that's one of my personal concerns is the, the late effects of um, iodine might include secondary malignancies. We don't have fully established proof of that, particularly in people who have been treated as children. But what has consistently fallen out is uh, the occurrence of leukemias um, after a lot of high dosing with radioactive iodine. Um, there are some concerns about some of these other cancers that you can see on the slide as well. Now, the picture on the right is actually uh, a young woman who has no evidence of thyroid cancer. All of this uptake is physiological uptake, and it just reminds us what normal tissues can be exposed to radiation and why we certainly want to minimize the risk to the normal tissues if we can. So in general, to summarize a very complex topic, but you know, our approach is, is such that for a child who has a good prognosis with their thyroid cancer, we know that even with widely advanced disease at presentation, in general, the, the, the life expectancy is quite prolonged. And we've never quite fully studied the risks long term to these children. So we really should be using iodine in cases where we truly believe it's going to benefit the child. I won't mention um, too much. Uh, I don't even have any slides, but it just came to me that I didn't really talk. Uh, we're not talking about advanced disease. You know, very rarely we may see a child who does have advanced thyroid cancer that no longer responds to radioactive iodine. And the good news is that, at least on the adult front, you know, there are a lot of drugs that are being developed to target this, this orphan disease. And um, you know, for those of you with medullary um, ties, you know that the first FDA-approved drug for medullary carcinoma just came out in April of this year. And so I wouldn't be surprised if over the next few years we will have more specific labeling for some of these oral medications to treat papillary and follicular carcinomas as well. The long-term treatment and follow-up of children includes, uh, again, this is for the differentiated carcinomas, that we, we do keep the TSH suppressed. But after a few years of having no evidence of disease, we would tend to lessen that suppression because we don't know the long-term impact of maintaining a fully suppressed TSH uh, throughout the course of a child's life. Monitoring thyroid function studies is important to get the dose right, particularly in children who are still growing and developing. And then we monitor the tumor markers and neck ultrasound regularly every six months or so. We can talk more details about specific situations, but in general, for metastatic disease, we would tend to keep an eye on that as well. And um, after initial treatment with radioactive iodine, uh, we usually wait at least a year, sometimes more, to repeat the thyroid scan and to see if, what the impact of that first iodine dose has been. <coughs> 
Let me go ahead and just run through these slides real quick because I think we should be okay in time and I know there are some people on the uh, call who have more medullary focused questions. So medullary carcinoma in childhood, as Dr. Francis mentioned, is, is not derived from the thyroid follicular cells. It's derived from cells called C cells that live among the thyroid follicles. And in childhood, almost all cases of medullary carcinoma are identified in the setting of a hereditary endocrine tumor syndrome called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2A or type 2B. There are some rare cases of medullary in childhood that are not associated with a specific mutation, um, and, and those are, are generally treated similarly to adults. But in any and 2A, almost all patients who inherit this gene mutation, and, and it's a gene mutation in a gene called RET, R-E-T, almost all patients eventually at some point of their lives will develop medullary carcinoma. In some of these mutations, there is a risk for the parathyroids becoming hyperplastic and causing a disease called hyperparathyroidism. And up to 50% of uh, patients with MEN2A will, uh, are at risk for getting a benign tumor of the adrenal gland called a pheochromocytoma. MEN2B is also due to mutations in the RET proto-oncogene. They're different mutations compared with MEN2A. And in these children, they have the most aggressive presentations of medullary thyroid carcinoma. So it's a, it's a highly penetrant uh, finding in MEN2B. They also have the same risk for pheochromocytoma. In contrast to MEN2A, patients with MEN2B do not get calcium disorders, but instead they have a very unique phenotype, um, uh, meaning they the physical findings, they have little soft tissue bumps on their eyelids and, and uh, tongues and throughout the GI tract. They are often tall and lanky and have what's called a morphinoid body habitus. So these children can be identified also by the appearance on physical examination. These are just some examples of the uh, tongue findings up at the top. Um, the thickened lips that we see in the bottom left corner and a uh, neuroma that's on the eyelid in this patient in the bottom right hand corner. So whenever we see a child who has these manifestations in a thyroid nodule, our immediate concern is one for medullary carcinoma. This is a busy slide, but just to show that in MEN2, um, there is something called a genotype-phenotype correlation, meaning that the particular gene that's mutated can help to predict what going to happen in that child, and it also helps us to understand the management of children with RET mutations. I won't cover this because Dr. Francis already talked about it, but this is talking about, uh, this is demonstrating the typical progression of disease. Unlike papillary and follicular, where we don't have a good handle on how a cancer develops, in medullary we have it pretty well figured out for the hereditary forms. And we know that there is a stepwise progression of disease from C-cell hyperplasia up at the top to a small microscopic medullary to a bigger multifocal medullary. And uh, this happens over years. It doesn't happen overnight. And it's unusual to see metastatic disease until the disease has been there a while longer and is usually a bigger size. MTC is also a disease that is primarily treated with surgery, and, and the same rules would apply for medullary carcinoma, identifying the right team, particularly the right surgeon who is experienced with the management of this disease. Because usually, almost always, we would do a central neck dissection, for example, in, this, in a child who presents with medullary carcinoma. We do not give radioactive iodine because this tumor does not respond to the radioactive iodine treatment. And unlike PTC and DTC, in uh, FTC, we actually keep the TSH normal long term. And we have unique tumor markers for medullary, and those are called calcitonin and CEA. Um, these are very sensitive markers for medullary carcinoma. And what we do, and actually there's now some data of, of using thyroglobulin in this fashion too, is we actually calculate how quickly these markers are rising. And if they're doubling, over less than a year's time, that is suggestive of a much more aggressive process and would, would warrant more comprehensive evaluation if the disease, to find the disease and also perhaps earlier intervention. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, some recent papers have also looked at using thyroglobulin in this fashion.
And in medullary carcinoma, CEA seems to be a better predictor, actually, of prognosis. So we pay close attention to the CEA levels in addition to the calcitonin. Now, the hardest question, and I won't spend time on this, this could be a lecture in and of itself, but the hardest question we face as pediatric endocrinologists is when you have a child who's identified to have a mutation in red but does not yet have clinical disease of medullary carcinoma. In that case, we have to help decide when is the best time to prophylactically treat the child with surgery, meaning removing their thyroid. The American Thyroid Association um, does have guidelines similar to the papillary guidelines. They have guidelines for medullary, and, and I would refer um, interested people to, to get this article, and we can certainly send it to you as well. But the thought process is also evolving in terms of how we approach children who do not have medullary carcinoma but are at risk for getting medullary carcinoma. And the hardest part uh, we have to answer in clinic is when should we intervene? I think we all agree we need to take out a child's thyroid before they get any metastatic disease because we want a cure. You, we don't ever want a child to have to deal with metastasis. But do we need to take it out even before the cancer develops? Or do we take it out even before C-cell hyperplasia develops? So the current thought process really is that we probably um, need to understand better how to identify children who need their thyroid removed when it's at this stage, before metastasis, but maybe not so early that they're having thyroid thyroidectomies when they're very, very young. Because as all of you guys know who deal with children who take thyroid on a daily basis, there are some issues that come along with that. So our charge is in medullary and in hereditary um, conditions is to really recognize those children who will need the early surgical intervention. And similar to papillary and follicular, to start to recognize when we're okay not treating a child and you know, to try to keep their quality of life as good as possible for as long as possible. So currently, based upon the gene mutation that's inherited, we can counsel a family um, as to when to start clinical testing. And by clinical testing, what I mean is we do ultrasounds and we actually do calcitonin levels. And if a child has a mutation that's not very high risk, has a normal calcitonin level, and a normal calcitonin level, um, it depends on the assay that's used, but generally it's less than 5 in a girl and less than 8 in a boy, um, and a, a normal ultrasound, those are children that we're actually now offering observation instead of early thyroidectomy. So to summarize for both Gary and myself, pediatric thyroid cancer is rare, but hopefully you can see it's a highly treatable condition with excellent long-term outcomes. For differentiated thyroid carcinoma, at least in some of our minds, um, radioactive iodine treatment is not necessarily a given, and we're actually starting to use more tailor-based treatment based upon the child's individual clinical characteristics and their risk for long-term morbidity and mortality from papillary carcinoma or follicular carcinoma. And I think we all agree that treatment by an experienced team is important. So, you know, all of, you know, everyone should try to find the, the, the team closest to them that would meet uh, the criteria here. So with that, I will stop, and I guess we can start with the question and answer period. I think that Dr. Francis may have his phone on mute. No, I just put mine back. Okay, great. <laughs> that was a great presentation, you guys. Thank you so much for all of that great information. Looking forward to hearing some discussion of the questions as well. Who wants to go first? Well, I guess if it's okay with Stephen, I'll go first. There were a couple of questions that seemed to um, uh, be similar, and maybe we can both comment on those. Uh, a couple of people asked questions about follicular thyroid cancer. And uh, one of the questions was, do we always treat that with radioactive iodine? And sort of a similar related question, um, what would one do for a minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer? And I think for all these 
forms of differentiated thyroid cancer, as Stephen so eloquently put, we are using radioactive iodine more and more selectively. So I would say the answer to the first question, do we always use radioactive iodine? No. Um, and so for people with minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer, which means just a few cells invading the capsule, nowhere else, pretty much in one location, I would not typically do that. Um, so I'd see if Stephen has a different take on that, but. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the hard part is minimally, when a tumor is, when a follicular carcinoma is widely invasive, the pathologist can clearly see invasion into blood vessels and invasion outside of the tumor capsule. Minimally invasive is very subjective, and a lot of pathologists actually won't agree whether it's benign and it's just an artifact of how the, the tumor is prepared on the slide, or is it truly a carcinoma. But I think uh, we don't have a lot of data in children, but at least in adults with minimally invasive tumors, we recognize that those are fairly low-risk tumors. So a lot, I, I think what might sway me is the size of the tumor. You know, if, if the tumor was five centimeters, perhaps I might think harder about iodine with a minimally invasive. But if the tumor was one and a half or two centimeter minimally invasive, then I agree that this is a situation where we tend to watch now. Yeah. Um, the other question that uh, was related to differentiated thyroid cancer was, what about uh, children who have uh, metastatic disease that does not seem to be responding to I-131? And um, I guess that's always a difficult issue. Um, what defines not responding and at what level do we consider giving up on radioactive iodine and moving on to potentially other therapies? So um, I think for children who have lung metastases, um, by the time one gets somewhere on the order of uh, 350, 500, something in that order of magnitude, millicuries total accumulated dose, we tend to get um, much more increasing concern about continuing additional doses. We would like to see some uh, decrease in, uh, some, some evidence for decrease in disease, either um, decreasing uh, lung metastases, decreasing thyroid globulin after each dose. We'd like to see something that shows continued improvement. So if there's truly no change in thyroid globulin, there's truly no change in lesions, then we have to sort of decide, is this worth continuing to use this therapy, or should we consider um, something else? Um, one approach to that that's being done in some centers is lesional dosimetry. Uh, Stephen talked about whole body dosimetry, but with lesional dosimetry, you take the uptake into each individual lesion and try to determine whether or not you can, in fact, give a big enough dose of radioactive iodine to impact on that lesion at all, and sometimes you can't. Um, and in the same patient at the same time, you might find some lesions that are going to be responsive and others that are not. Um, so in those patients, we do consider um, watching. Again, the long-term survival for kids with pulmonary metastasis shows that many of them have stable but persistent disease, even though we don't keep treating with radioactive iodine. Um, there are experimental protocols that Stephen is doing at MD Anderson and other centers around the country, and maybe, maybe he'd like to jump in with that. One thing I was going to point out is that once a patient with papillary or follicular carcinoma has a post-treatment scan, so say they get a second or third dose of iodine, and once that post-treatment scan shows no evidence of uptake in the cancer, then that's a time where we say, okay, this disease is non-iodine avid, and that's a time that we actually stop evaluating and thinking about giving more radioactive iodine. So, so a lot of times, you know, in children, fortunately, they have such iodine avid tumors that, you know, you can give a dose, wait some time, it may be one, two, three years, um, and then give a second dose. And then gradually do that uh, until it's clear that you know the tumor is either responsive, which it does in most cases, and if it's not responding, then before you get to that third and fourth dose, then you have to really think, well, what is the iodine doing in this case? So again, that's a rarer situation, but we certainly you know do see that, and and children can have these typical adult-like tumors that don't take up iodine and continue to progress. So what we do in that situation is, if we know there's lung nodules, for example.
and the child has gotten, say, two doses of iodine, and there was no uptake on the, on the treatment scan to make me think that it's going to work. And at that point, we just image the nodules. And if those nodules continue to significantly grow over time, which they may or may not do, then that's a time where at some point we might need to consider an alternative approach. And, you know, the current approach is using these oral medications that are called targeted therapies. And, you know, again, this is primarily being studied in adults. Um, there is a study at the NCI for children with vendetinib, which is the drug I mentioned is just approved for medullary carcinoma. So we are learning more and slowly um, understanding how this might apply also to children who have advanced disease. But the future is bright, and, and I think, you know, five, ten years from now, we'll, we'll have a lot more in our armamentarium of how to treat advanced cases like that. But in general, because a child has distant metastasis that don't take up iodine, that doesn't mean they all of a sudden need to go on chemotherapy or some type of therapy, because usually we're okay just maintaining TSH suppression and observing over time. And then I think uh, the other cancer were some questions about uh, medullary thyroid cancer look like. Stephen, do you want to take yeah, a look at some other stuff? There was one question, too, just briefly about familial non-medullary thyroid carcinoma. We didn't really touch on that. Uh, so that, that is when uh, papillary carcinoma is, appears to be within a family, so it can be passed from generation to generation and it's called familial non-medullary because it's not medullary and it, and it tends to be papillary. So about 3 to 5 percent of all papillary cancer cases are actually in this category. The problem is that we don't know what causes it, so it's, there's not like a gene like RET that we can identify to test children. So what I have tended to recommend, and Gary can tell me what his thoughts are, but usually around the age of 15 I would recommend a screening ultrasound if the family history is really strong. If it's just a parent, you know, you can argue that that might not benefit, but if there's multiple family members with familial non-medullary thyroid carcinoma, then I start with an ultrasound, and then we would treat that child similarly to any child with thyroid nodules. If thyroid nodules are identified and if they're suspicious, we would go ahead and biopsy that and treat that child accordingly. Now, in terms of the medullary questions, um, let's see, there was... Um, one question about hereditary medullary and calcitonin and CEA levels. And, and basically, as I mentioned, you know, it, it is important, particularly if a child has not had surgery yet, to, to monitor that. And generally for a boy, um, a calcitonin level less than 8 is considered normal, at least in the assay we use. So you have to just see what the lab is that you're using. And the CEA is usually, uh, assuming he's a non-smoker, hopefully, usually is less than 3. And again, if those are normal and ultrasound is normal and the mutation is not a very high risk mutation, that could be a situation where um, the patient's watched. And another quick question about staging, uh, about medullary staging. So actually, medullary staging is the same for adults and kids. Um, the, the difference in staging is actually for differentiated carcinomas. It's papillary and follicular. So the highest stage a child with papillary can be at stage 2, even if they had widespread metastatic disease. But a medullary actually is staged similarly to adults. So actually a child could get up to stage 4 medullary carcinoma. And then there were some other questions, looks like, on... Um, um, Says pediatric parents compare effects of teens and preteens adjusting to thyroid hormones and difficulties in school. Um, do we have any comment? Um, I'm not sure that I know exactly what the question is seeking, but um, certainly patients uh, with thyroid cancer who are on um, somewhat high doses of thyroid hormone in order to fully suppress TSH may have um, some uh, mood uh, disorder or um, attention disorder uh, when their thyroid hormone levels are very high. Um, and certainly if they um, do not uh, continue to maintain therapy on a day-to-day -day basis, they can have wide swings in thyroid hormone levels that could impact on um, mood and uh, difficulties in school. Um, but the majority of uh, children that I see, and I 
like to hear Stephen's comments too, um, do very well with uh, thyroid hormone suppression therapy, even though their uh, thyroid hormone levels are elevated and their TSH levels are suppressed. Uh, most of them do very well. Certainly if individual patients are having trouble with school, then that's where you need to involve the school personnel and in individual uh, educational plans, 504 plans, that sort of thing, to try to assist. Um, and sometimes you do have to sort of back off on therapy a bit and say, well, you know, um, we know that this is a relatively good prognosis disease. Um, we know that suppression of TSH is one of our uh, key elements in long-term treatment and follow-up, but to what extent do we need to suppress that TSH? Uh, that data is a little less clear. So, um, so oftentimes if kids are having particular problems when their thyroid hormone levels are a little high, um, I do back off on therapy and, and we recognize that um, that may may potentially increase their risk to develop recurrent disease, but I don't know that we have any way to quantify that. Any comments from your side, Stephen? No, I agree. I'm, I know it's, it's hard, to, you know, as I've mentioned, I know to some people before, it's, this is a very unique cancer to deal with because, you know, most other solid tumors in children, it's either there or it's not. And long term, there's usually not ongoing medications you have to take, whereas in, in typical papillary carcinoma, and in many cases a medullary, you have to be on thyroid hormone the rest of your lives. You might have tumor markers that state that there's still disease, but yet it can't be found. And that's a lot to deal with over the course of one's life. And, and I think that's just an understudied area um, in these, you know, in these children. And, um, you know, all the, I know all the moms and dads out there know that, you know, there is, outside of FICA, there's not really a good home for these children who, who deal with very unique issues as it relates to, to their malignancy. And I think partly, hopefully, we can help, you know, it's always hard in the, in the context of a very limited clinic appointment. Um, you know, we all wish we had more time to, to focus on those things. But, but I hope by continued dialogue and education and reassurance that, you know, everyone, you know, your child's doing okay, that this disease is, is, is acting okay, then that too will hopefully, you know, improve outlooks. Well, I think we've gotten to most of our questions. Would you gentlemen agree? I think so. Great. Well, then I want to thank everybody, the participants, the presenters, the listeners, the people who are here now, the people who will be joining us, listening again sometime in the future. Thank you all for coming today. And I also want to remind you that the national conference, the annual conference, will be in Los Angeles. October. So please look at FICA.org for the details and try to find some way to get there. So I think that if you found this information useful, which undoubtedly you have, you'll agree that there's going to be a lot more uh, to come in October. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. And we'll see you soon, hopefully, at the next, at the next uh, conference.